Welcome to This Academic Life, Episode 11. Hi, I'm Panya Newell. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Hi, my name is Lucy Zhang. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering. Hi, my name is Kim Michelle Lewis. I'm associate dean of research and professor of physics. Today's show is motivated by our interest in promoting STEM among young students. We also wanted to know what is on the minds of young students as it relates to STEM, the academy, and being a professor. Today, we have Kingston, a seventh grader, and Phoenix, a fourth grader from Durham, North Carolina. Kingston and Phoenix, welcome to the show. Phoenix, why don't you start us off with your question as it relates to professors who are in STEM? We want to know what you're thinking. Hi, thank you for inviting my brother and me to the podcast. My first question is, how do you schedule your work? We have a different schedule than the teachers that you have. My kids are also in elementary school, and I know that the teachers oftentimes teach one subject and then they stay in school all day uh, teaching different different classrooms or they are the home teacher when the kids are younger they stay with the kids all day long and teach them different topics and subjects for us we teach a couple of classes for each semester so for example I'm teaching one class right now and that class takes place twice a week and so that's my fixed schedule and the rest of it are really up to us to decide so our schedule looks very different every day and it depends on whether we have deadlines coming up it depends on when we're teaching and when the exams are coming up and so we need to prepare for those materials and uh, the most important thing that we're doing or majority of the time that we're working on are maintaining our research labs. So that involves working with my graduate students and getting research done and making sure we're being productive and we write papers, we communicate with our collaborators. So a lot of that is uh, filling up our schedule. So overall, our everyday life is very different, and uh, we have a lot of flexibility in designing our schedule, which is one really beautiful part of being a professor. Do professors only teach at colleges or universities? I'll take that question. Most professors are typically full-time employees of their specific university or colleges, but uh, some do volunteer work at uh, other schools or other places. For instance, we might teach a short course at uh, another school or uh, during a conference. We also might visit K through 12 classrooms and teach some STEM uh, related projects. Some of my colleagues even travel internationally and they teach during summer programs at some schools, for instance, in South American countries or in African countries. How do you make sure all your work gets done? Phoenix, that question is a hard question. I don't think we will ever get our work done. And this is just an ongoing battle. And uh, (laughs) the nature of our uh, work is there's no end to it. Right, so that's just the nature of research. For example, you have an open question and we're trying to look for answers. And if we're lucky, in a few years, we might be able to find a answer to to that research question. Oftentimes, even if we do, we need to define another research question. So our work really never gets done. There's always more work. So that's why it's really, at least for me, I have my own daily goals. I kind of break up my long-term goals into into a to-do list. And my to-do list is separated into a daily to-do list and a weekly to-do list and hopefully a monthly to-do list. I kind of separate those out so that at the end of the day, I feel like I accomplish some very specific tasks related or contributing to my long-term goals. Is being a professor a hard and stressful job? All right. So this one, I'm going to say it depends on how you define stressful and hard. (laughs) So if you define stressful and hard as long work hours, then yes. However, you know, I I have to say Kingston and Phoenix, we do get a lot of joy from our work. 
especially when it comes to working with students in the classroom and working on our research projects. The gratification that we get when we see students in our lectures and we see the moment they understand an, a concept or an idea, then we're, we're so happy because then that means that we have done the very best that we could to make sure we deliver that information to you. And I'm sure that when you're in your classes, you can see the excitement when the student recognizes that, oh, you finally understand what I've been saying for the past 30 minutes or for the past hour. It's the same type of gratification. And I have to say that gratification definitely outweighs the job being hard or stressful. So that's what I would say. So it depends on how you define it. How do you grade your assignments? Thank you, Phoenix, for asking that question. That's an interesting one because some faculty that they are teaching large classrooms, they never grade their assignments. Uh, students assignment. For example, if you are teaching a class of 800 students, it's impossible to teach and also to grade homework assignments. So for large room classrooms, usually there are teaching assistants that they help with other responsibilities, including uh, grading the assignments and uh, holding office hours for the students to answer their questions. Uh, but for the smaller classrooms, uh, typically graduate level classrooms, if then in my institute, if the number of the students are below some certain numbers, the faculties are responsible for grading the assignments. But most of the undergraduate classes uh, that I'm teaching, they are larger. Uh, for instance, last semester, my classroom had 140 students and I had graders and also teaching assistants that they were helping me with grading. Do I need a PhD to become a professor? So I'm glad that you said, do I need a PhD? I'm glad you personalized that. So I like that you're taking ownership. That means you're thinking about it. So that's great. So this was a tough question to answer. So in my opinion, the answer is no. Professors can be scholars who have qualifications to teach at a college or university. So for example, like your dad teaches at a university and his students address him as professor right? My opinion, the answer is no. As long as you have the right qualifications to teach at the collegiate or a university level, the students will likely address you as professor. And I believe for community college, you need a doctorate of education rather than a specific area. It doesn't have to be community college, but in some colleges, uh, that degree is needed instead of a PhD. What made you want to become a professor? How did you decide your field? Okay, so for me, actually, when I was nine years old, I wanted to become a scientist and cure cancer. That was my dream. I always wanted to do that. But when I was in ninth grade, uh, I had to choose between math and science major. And I remember that the principal called my dad to her office and try to encourage him to convince me to go to the math major rather than the science major. But actually that was already my decision because I loved math and physics more than biology and other related uh, courses to, to medical field. And that's where I diverged from my dream to becoming a you know, scientist and cure cancer. But it wasn't until later in graduate school that I decided to become a professor. In my family, we have many engineers and also professors in, med uh, in engineering field, and they influenced my decision to become an engineer too. Yeah, my path is, I have a lot of influence from my family, from my dad, who is also a mechanical engineer. He, I mean, he's retired now, uh, but um, I'm very much in, influenced by him. But the decisions of becoming a professor or even the decision of becoming a mechanical engineer, they are totally irrelevant. I had no plan in doing any of these. I just thought, I just, I was scared <laughs> to look for a job after my college. And I said, oh, maybe I should do a 
a master's. So I then applied for grad school. And then after my master's, I said, oh, I'm too scared to look for a job. So I said, oh, I, it's easier to stay in school. So I stayed <laughs> to get my PhD. And then afterward, the market that year was terrible. I had an industrial job offer that got kind of rescinded after they gave me an offer uh, because of some budget cut that they had temporarily. So I was in a limbo, not wasn't in a limbo, but I was actively looking for a job because I was about to graduate. And I just started interviewing, applied for a couple places, and I ended up landing a, an academic job, which lasted until today. So nothing planned and nothing was, you know, scheduled, but I did have a lot of wise words from my dad who give me a lot of encouragement along the way. So that was really important for me. So for me, I had a, a high school teacher that was very influential in my decision to become a physicist. Um, she was one of the only high school teachers at my school with a graduate degree. She was probably the first Black female scientist I ever met. And one day she allowed me to assist in a physics demonstration. And I believe it had to do with optics and lasers. And that experience really engaged my curiosity and my fascination about science. That experience was actually compounded by the fact that I went to an all black high school and she had received her degree from historically black college and university. So seeing her in the front of the classroom with a master's in physics from an all-Black college, I think was just really astounding to me because, like I said, she was probably one of the few science teachers that I had that had an advanced degree. And she just was so passionate about, you know, science and physics. And she was just so excited, especially when I volunteered to help her. And just having that it was just like energy that I just never forget. And for all my life, I'm always going to remember that introduction into the science world that was provided to me by a Black female scientist. And so I think that has inspired me to continue to, to do what I'm doing now as a, a physicist. What path do you need to take to become a professor? What steps do you need to take in school to reach that goal? So, so in elementary, junior high, and high school, I think the, the steps are mostly based on your academic performance. It's doing well in all your classes, um, whether they're history classes or art classes or music classes, just doing well academically. It all sets the foundation for you to get scholarships to, to go to college. So once you do well in high school, I mean, you're at the top of your class and, and maybe you don't need to be at the top of the class. You just need to do well, right? And you go to college and you need to major in um, a science or a math, um, some STEM field. So biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics, um, engineering. And that typically lasts about four years. So you get an undergraduate degree or a bachelor's of science in a particular field. So that's four years. And in college, you also need to do well, right? So sometimes, depending on what type of college you go to, you may have to still take classes that are unrelated to science. Like, I remember I took German. I had to take two, two years of foreign language. And has, in my mind, it has nothing to do with physics, but we still had to take those classes, and I still had to do well in them. And one nice thing at the time when I was in college was the better I did in my classes, the more scholarship funds I got, right? So I was able to pay for school because I was always doing well in my science classes. And so that really helps your parents out a lot. So big plug for doing well so that your parents pay less tuition money, right? <laughs> and then once you get out of undergrad, um, you choose a, a, another university where you spend at least maybe five to six years. And so most often, you choose a university based on the field that you want to go into. So for me, at the time, applied physics was 
what I wanted to do. And one of the best programs in the country at the time, um, and still is, I shouldn't say at the time, it still is a very highly ranked University of Michigan. So I chose to go there and I spent six years at the University of Michigan. That's where I met your mom, right? And it was a long six years, but I don't regret it. So once you do that, those are the steps. So it's sort of like high school diploma, undergraduate degree. After undergraduate degree, you get what's called a graduate degree. So then you do it another six years. So that's pretty much the steps. But then there are some things that people don't tell you, right? about what it takes to get a PhD. And one thing I, and I, when I thought about this question, I, I also, I really thought about Kingston and his creativity because Kingston draws, right? You, you do a lot of artwork and, and one thing that I think we don't tell you all enough is that it really takes a lot of creativity to come up with solutions to challenging problems in science and engineering. And I really think that your creativity in the arts will really, really, really help you excel when you start, when you go into engineering and science, because they'll have problems that you just won't be able to open up a textbook or Google and find an answer. You're going to need to think out of the box. So all of those characters that you draw and all of the storylines that you put together will all come to you and you say, you know what, this is how I'm going to solve this problem. And you're going to be amazed at how many doors open up to you in terms of all of the solutions you can come up with because your mind is just just right in that space to, to think outside of the box, right? So if that's one piece of advice I can offer you is to be flexible in terms of building your hobbies and your skill set. You don't have to say, I'm just going to do STEM and that's it. Pick up a musical instrument, learn music, draw, do the arts, pick up a foreign language. All of these things stimulate your brain to motivate you to just think outside of the box. I think that's the best way I can put it. So make sure you, you know, pick up hobbies along the way and don't just uh, narrowly focus just on science and mathematics alone. And I think you'll have a very well-rounded experience. If you could restart from kindergarten and go on a completely different career path, would you? I can answer that, but I should say that I've never been to kindergarten. But if I started, I guess maybe I'll go to kindergarten first. (laughs) And also I would, I always wanted, if I had the opportunity, if I go back, I wanted to get my undergraduate in applied math, applied physics and computer science. Uh, all these three, because I believe that these are the foundation for anything that you want to uh, do. And also, if I can go back and continue, I want to become a neurologist because I'm so fascinated by the brain and how the brain works and how little we know about it. And maybe I can, with that, cure cancer, but maybe related to brain uh, and go back to you know my original dream of becoming a scientist. I, I'm fascinated by this question. I don't think I want to change a thing. You know, my life is not perfect. I get to this point, a lot of it is through trial and error. I failed a lot. And, you know, in the meantime, I succeeded. For me, a lot of it is a process. We go through this process, a process of education, process of learning, learning about knowledge and learning about life and learning about how we Uh, live in this society. For me, it's a full process. I enjoyed the entire process. I enjoyed all my experiences, good or bad. So I definitely don't want to start all over from kindergarten. I I definitely, (laughs) I definitely, if I can, yeah, I can't do, yeah. But one thing I have to say is I agree with Lucy that we've been trained to the point where there are things that I wanted to do before I became a physicist. I wanted to be a medical doctor. I wanted to be a pediatrician. I wanted to do that. But now when I think about it, I can, like Lucy said, I can still do that, but I have the luxury of not going to school to do those things. What that, what I mean by that, I can just use my research to collaborate with someone who's a medical doctor, who's studying or dermatologist. So for example, 
I have vitiligo, right? And I've had vitiligo all my life. And I've always tried to figure out why these doctors haven't figured this out, right? And I'm so closely attached to it. I'm saying, I'm saying to myself, why don't I just talk to a dermatologist who is also doing research and see if any of my techniques that I use in my research lab, I do all type of spectroscopy measurements and all type of electrical measurements. Is there anything I can do to help them test their hypothesis out, right? Are there cells that I can look at under my fancy microscope? Is there some electrical signals that I can generate from, you know, so I feel like if I really set my mind to it, I can not necessarily be a medical doctor, but I can collaborate with medical doctors to solve problems. And I think that's like a luxury that STEM majors and those who have a PhD have. We have that luxury that we can go back and, and collaborate with people in other disciplines to, to solve very complex problems. All right. So we will go to questions we'll ask you, and I know we're running a bit over time, but hopefully you enjoy the questions that we'll ask you. So Lucy, you want to go first? All right. So my first question is, in your class or in your classes, how many of your friends are actually interested in science and math? Um, for me, I guess I'd say most of my class actually is interested in science. The other part of my class, they're interested in like being a YouTuber or doing streaming or like being a movie star acting, stuff like that. But a lot of my friends, they're interested in doing computer science and stuff with video games. So that's something that they want to do. So my follow-up question is outside schools, are there any activities that that you guys participate in that are related to science and math or anything that you you know you feel that had benefited you uh, besides the classroom? Um, right now, I'm actually in this program called um, CS Sidekicks. It's a Duke program, and it's computer science. I'm working with Python. So that's something that I'm doing right now. It's pretty fun. That's awesome. Can you apply for University of Utah when you <laughs> decide? <laughs> so, so I guess my questions are along the same directions as Lucy asked. So when you guys do well in your science and math assignments, do you hear any word of encouragement by your teachers? Any of you? Um, yeah, I mean. Yeah, I hear words of encouragement. Yeah. How about you, Kingston? Um, yeah, when I do well in my science and math classes, some of my teachers might um, try to promote or send me to programs. For example, my computer science teacher um, recommended the CS Psychics program that I'm in right now. So, wow. yeah. Okay, interesting. Okay, so, so basically try to provide other opportunities outside classroom for you too, right? Yeah. Wonderful. Kingston and Phoenix, thank you so much for the questions. The questions definitely provided insight into what is on the mind of young students who are curious about professors in STEM. Also, thank you for taking time to share your experiences in and outside of the classroom about STEM. We really appreciated your responses. Thank you for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this conversation. Find us at thisacademiclife.org or follow us on Facebook. You can listen to our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or Google Podcasts. Please rate us. We welcome any feedback or suggestions for future episodes. Join us next time for the good, the bad, and the ugly of this academic life.